I'm Jared Atkinson. I'm going to be talking about porting binary modules from, uh, shoot, bi binary modules to Linux and OSX. So uh, a little bit of background. So I do power, the Power Forensics Project, which is a, I'll describe that here in a bit. It's uh, kind of infosec focused. And usually my presentations are very deep into how, like, how you would do forensic analysis with PowerShell and all that kind of stuff. This one's a little bit higher level on more of a development perspective. So um, if you're not necessarily interested in security, uh, directly, but you're more interested in how, like, how I'm able to form this uh, module or kind of organize it. This is the the presentation for you. All right. Okay. So, uh, what day was this? Uh, August 18th, 2016. Jeffrey Snover tweeted out that uh, that PowerShell was being open sourced, and so for people like me who uh, want to be able to use PowerShell on literally everything, that was amazing. Um, it created tons of opportunities for, for my different modules, but it also created a number of challenges, namely in lack of documentation, right? And so um, it's great that I could write my binary module and run it on OSX, but there was nothing, literally nothing to tell you how to do that, right? And so, um, and when I first submitted this talk, I originally had tons of things I wanted to talk about, and then, you know, eventually Microsoft made things a lot easier. So I had, like, for instance, uh, the the DLLs that uh, different classes were implemented in in core power, uh, .NET Core and in uh, full CLR were different. And so you used to have to kind of do that by hand and make sure that everything worked. You don't have to do that anymore. It's a little bit easier. And so I, I originally was kind of worried about this presentation, but apparently there's a lot more to it than I kind of remember. So let's kind of get into it. All right. So uh, first, I'm going to do a brief introduction to Power Forensics, just because that's going to be our case study that we're using for the overall presentation. And I'm going to talk about how to kind of integrate .NET Core into your, into your module or your development project. Uh, talk about cross-platform APIs. Um, I'll talk about why that's important. Abstracting those API calls. And then dealing with multiple assemblies. So for instance, I'm going to be interested in running on PowerShell version 2 all the way through open source PowerShell running on OS X or Linux, right? And so um, you can't compile one, one assembly for all of those. And so I have to be able to you know, deal with both and multiple assemblies and things like that. Um, and then running binary modules remotely. So I'll talk about why that would be important. All right. So what is Power Forensics? It's a uh, Power Sh or C Sharp module that allows you to do forensic-y type things in PowerShell, right? And so what do I mean by forensic-y type things? Um, I, basically, the idea that uh, you could parse all the different data structures on disk. So this is a disk forensics utility that allows you to look into, for instance, the master file table or the master boot record or the USN journal, even now uh, the file allocation table, so fat, fat file system parsing is included. Um, you could do things like uh, recover deleted files, right? And so, um, and we're able to do that because we're parsing the master file table, which still will have references to deleted files, and we could recover those. Um, ultimately, the kind of goal is to get to these guys, so like HFS Plus, which is the uh, default file system on Mac, or was the default file system on older, older versions of Mac, or EXT4, which is like your typical Ubuntu is going to have the ex extended file system on it. Yes? Uh, so right now it does not, um, but that would be a, a cool thing. Um, resilient file system is probably one of the least documented major file systems, so there's a lot of reverse engineering effort that would have to go into that, because um, that's one thing that Microsoft has decided not to open source yet. So since you, you're working on the region thing on the VS Code, can you work on that? All right, cool. Okay, so yeah. All right, so project goals. So these are the Power Forensics overarching project goals, and this is kind of how I'm going to structure my thought process through developing this talk or this uh, module. So we want transparent user interaction. So originally, when I started working on this, I created three different modules. I had Power Forensics version two, Power Forensics core, and Power Forensics portable. And I was like, hey, users, here's three different modules. Pick the one that you want for your situation and just kind of go at it, and there, you know, Unfortunately, nobody cares about Power Forensics quite as much as I do, right? And so at the end of the day, that didn't work very well. And so we, we kind of got to figure out a way around that. Uh, major file system support, I just talked about that. Uh, be able to run remotely. So I do threat hunting, which is the idea that you're going into an environment uh, for a customer and you're trying to determine whether or not there's been a breach in their environment. And so um, being able to run these type of queries at, at scale is very important. And so something like invoke command and being able to push out all this information on a remote system is pretty nice. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the option of saying, hey, push out Power Forensics to every single system in your, in your environment, and so we need to kind of work around that. 
So I'll talk about that. Um, supports open source. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. All right. We're at least kind of on track here. Okay. Project roles is where we are. All right. Okay. So hopefully I don't kick any anything. Um, so the idea that we need to support open source PowerShell. So this means being able to run on Linux and Mac, just because I think that'd be really cool. Uh, one of the pro problems of the forensic community is that everybody wants to run Python tools on uh, on Ubuntu, basically. And so, uh, you know, trying to convince them to come to Windows and run my tool is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so I just want to bring my tool to them, I guess. And so that, that's really cool for me, from my perspective. Um, also, I want to be compatible with PowerShell version 2. One of the probably biggest use cases for Power Forensics is a company called Tanium, which does... Uh, Infrastructure management, they're uh, an agent that you could do kind of infrastructure management through, but they also have um, kind of a response or like a detection type platform as well. And so they need to be backwards compatible as far as possible because of their customer base. And so PowerShell version 2 compatibility was very important because of Windows 7. All right, so, so whenever I talk to Will, he always kind of describes kind of his ideal like blogging or presentation format is for somebody to kind of walk through what their thought process was. And so, uh, while I'm not claiming to be the expert that knows how to do binary modules, I, I, I had problems that I came across, and with lack of documentation, these are the solutions that I was able to come upon. And so I'm gonna kind of present it in like a problem and solution format. The idea, for instance, problem number one is integrating .NET Core. And so we had a current state. Power Forensics currently builds for .NET 3.5, which is compatible with PowerShell version two and, and later. Um, the desired state is that it's going to run on all PowerShell versions, including 2 and open source PowerShell and core PowerShell, so nano server, um, and then one set of source code. So I, I don't want to have to like go in and change you know, this piece of code for Power Forensics core and then go in and change it for Power, uh, Power Forensics v2 as well. right? I want to make one change and have everybody reference the same code. All right, so uh, generically, I want to kind of talk about, just give everybody a refresher. This is talking about top row is PowerShell versions, and then on the left is obviously the operating system, and just showing what versions are default and which are supported on what uh, file systems. This is thanks to Carlos Perez, dark operator. He, he uses this in some of his training, let me borrow it. So, um, And as you see, Windows 7 default is two point, uh, PowerShell 2, and so that's why we're really interested in that. All right, so uh, luckily there is now a blog post um, on MSDN that kind of talks about how you transition from a full CLR app to a core CLR app, right? And so this is the, the link here if you're interested. Um, what they do is they actually have like a GitHub page that has a couple sample projects that kind of answer some of the different questions that you may have. The easiest situation is if you have a full CLR uh, assembly and you want to go all the way to core, core CLR, right? And so you you don't have that PowerShell version 2 uh, requirement. You just can go with whatever the newest, latest, greatest thing is. And so in that case, you're going to fire up Visual Studio 2017, create a new uh, core, uh, C Sharp core or .NET core uh, application, and then you're just going to replace the code, basically. And so there may be some compatibility issues with things that are in full CLR but not in core CLR, and so you have to figure that out. But generally, the organization part is very easy. Um, for, for my project, uh, it's a little bit more difficult because I have those two requirements. And so um, the way that we're looking at this is we kind of have two projects. So there's Power Forensics, which is the full CLR version, um, version 2. Um, and then there's Power Forensics Core, which is the core CLR um, version that will be compatible with core, uh, PowerShell Core and open source PowerShell. And so here you see they have you know, two projects. We're just going to ignore the test for now because you know tests are hard. Um, and so we're, we have the car, so in their case, car is the, the core CLR, and then they have car.net 4.5, which is a uh, .net 4.5 application. Okay, so ultimately, this is what it looks like if you were to go to GitHub. Um, you notice that there's two projects in the source code, Power Forensics, which is this box here, and all that has is a csproj file, which kind of just uh, talks about how the project is defined. It references to the source code, which is located here in the Power Forensics core project. And so that's under the source directory. And so I will show that here. When the, 
AV went out, that kind of freaked out a little bit. Okay, so um, can everybody see that hopefully? Yeah, pretty good. In the back, you guys good? Okay. Um, so here's the Pro Power Forensics project. Uh, basically, Power Forensics, which is that V2 full CLR compatible version, is uh, basically just this CS project file. And so there, uh, for instance, here, when we're compiling, we're going to include all the source code, all the C Sharp uh, files that are in the Power Forensics core source directory, right? And so that's how we're referencing that one set of source code. As to where, when we go into Power Forensics core, we have, they use uh, project.json files, which I'll describe here in a second. Um, but generally, all the source code is right here. And so, you know, this is just a crazy amount of source code. But um, that's the general idea, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Okay. All right, so uh, kind of the solution was two projects. Uh, you have the full CLR reference the code in the core CLR version and then you, everybody's happy, right? And so you're building, at the end of the day, a, in my case, .NET 3.5 assembly and a uh, .NET standard 1.6 assembly. All right, so problem number two, and this is where like organizing, I didn't think was very sexy, but it's kind of like a, you must be this tall to ride the ride, and if you can't organize the project, then you aren't gonna be very successful. This is where it gets a little more interesting from my perspective. Um, so, uh, Power Forensics uses the create file API. The reason why we do that is to get a handle to a physical drive or logical volume. So if you're familiar with like slash slash dot slash physical drive zero, that is referencing the physical hard drive on the system. And so um, when you're doing forensics, you want to read from the lowest level possible. Um, and without a driver, that's going to be the lowest that we can get. And so uh, we want to read those bytes from there. Well, yes. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, so th the, the reason why you would want to do that is because uh, you're looking at a system that is likely compromised, right? And so the whole point of doing forensics is to investigate a potential compromise. And so attackers can lie the higher up you go in the stack. So uh, they could do things like hook, hook API calls and return false data and things like that. And so uh, well create file is technically vulnerable to being hooked. Um, every, everything that you would ever do uh, forensics with is going to use create file, like DD would use create file and so on and so forth. So um, that's kind of the idea behind that. All right. Um, so create file is a Windows API, right? And so we want to run this on Windows and Linux and OS X. And so, uh, you know, when you try to run create or call create file on OS X, it's going to tell you to screw off, right? Because it's not there. And so um, what we ended up needing to do was find what the equivalent version of or equivalent API to create file was. And so a little bit of Googling kind of told us, hey, uh, on Unix, uh, OS X and Linux in this case, the open API is the equivalent to create file. The problem is, is when you look at pinvoke, uh, which we're going to talk about here in a second, trying to define how to use the open API, it, there's literally no documentation except for source code, right? And so <laughs> you have to go back and see how Microsoft did it for the most part. And so one of the assumptions is um, that .NET Core can read files on Linux, and so open must be implemented somewhere in .NET Core, right? All right. So uh, kind of before we start digging in, um, C Sharp provides numerous ways to access API calls or API functions. Um, the most logical one to use is called Platform Invoke or pinvoke. Um, basically, the idea is you're allowing managed code, so C Sharp code, to call unmanaged functions that are exported from a DLL. So uh, like kernel32.dll exports a bunch of API functions, um, and so you're using pinvoke to be able to access those and, and allow you know, the C-sharp compiler to understand how to call those functions. And so there's a couple things you need to do. You need to have a declaration of that unmanaged function, and then you need to tell the compiler how to marshal uh, parameters from C, or well, C-sharp to C, right? So um, uh, like LPC uh, T string in C, there's no, there's no LPC T string in C-sharp, and so you need to know that that the C sharp type is going to be a string, um, or like a there's no handle in C sharp, so you need to use a, an int pointer, for example. All right. Okay. So uh, to do p invoke, the easiest way is to go to p invoke.net, which is a website that uh, is kind of community organized, and what they do is. Uh, people will go on when they successfully figure out how to implement a p invoke signature, and then they'll post it. For instance, this is output debug string, which is just 
a function to allow you to output a debug string, as you would imagine. And uh, so what they're doing is they're defining that it's in kernel 32.dll. Then they're basically uh, defining the function as output debug string and telling, telling it that it needs to take a string uh, as an argument, right? Um, if, if you're using an API call, which most of the time this will not be the case, that does not have a pinvoke signature on pinvoke.net, then you could go to msdn, which is going to describe how you would define that in C++, and then you get to figure out kind of that marshalling on your own. Um, I think on the previous slide, yeah, so if you have questions about how to marshal from C types to C sharp, then this website here is going to describe how you would do that. All right, so we're going to do a demo real quick of kind of a simple P invoke. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what we're doing, this is from PowerShell, obviously, um, but we're going to compile this C sharp source code, and then we're going to be able to call output debug string. So here we're telling it, hey, it's in kernel 32. Um, it's a, we're going to make it a public static extern, external um, function called output debug string, and then we're going to pass it a string message. So we're going to compile it here. And down here is a debug view, which is going to basically output that actual um, message as soon as we run it. And so this is how you would call it from PowerShell. And we're just going to say Win32 technique number three. This is all from uh, Matt Graber. He used this in one of his presentations, so I kind of stole it. Um, and so here we see that it actually did implement the function and write to the debug stream, right? All right, so now we know p invoke, right, generally. Um, we know that it's the open API function that we need to call. Um, but for instance, what DLL implements, what DLL does .NET Core use to implement the open API, right? I have no idea. The internet has no idea. And so, uh, <laughs> so ultimately, we need to basically go and figure out how Power, like my thought process was, we need to figure out how PowerShell implements it or how .NET Core implements it. And so uh, there's kind of two ways uh, to do this. One would be go to, going to GitHub. Luckily for us, .NET Core and PowerShell are open sourced, right? And so we could literally go to GitHub and just Google through until we find that. Um, or we can use DNSpy, which is a, a decompiler for C Sharp uh, assemblies or uh, applications. And so uh, I prefer DNSpy because it allows you to follow links a little bit easier, I think. Um, but generally, DNSpy will decompile your C Sharp assembly. Um, which you can find by using the uh, assembly class in system.reflection, and then it has a location property. So uh, we'll show a dnspy. So this first part's on my Mac, and uh, just showing that it's OS X. And then I'm going to, I know that the file stream class is the class that implement, that allows you to read from things. And so what I'm doing here is saying, okay, this is the path to that assembly. So now I need to take that assembly over to Windows uh, to run it in DNSpy. And so now I'm just loading up that assembly and it's decompiling it. So now I have the source or pseudo source code of what uh, of this assembly. And so now we're going to go look at that file stream class. Hopefully this is big enough. So this is I know that this is not big enough, but you'll I'll zoom in. And so these are all the different constructors for the file stream class. And so we're kind of going through. A lot of them don't really have anything going on. Um, but down here, I see this like init function. Um, and so I, I might want to like kind of follow that. And so you can right click uh, or even double click and say like open in a new tab. Uh, luckily, that the init function happened to be right below. And so we could kind of start to go look through that, see if there's anything. This is just kind of figuring out different arguments. Um, but then we see this open. We're looking for the open API, and we see a function called open. Cool. Let's, let's check that out. And so click on that. And we see that uh, this is just like an abstract reference to, to some function called open. Um, and so instead, I want to go look at the result of this, which is this inner stream. And so we kind of go up, and uh, we see here that the file stream, there's a new Unix file stream uh, method here. So let's. Let's check that out. That sounds like we're kind of going in the right direction. Um, usually this may take a little bit longer. Obviously, I ran through this before I recorded the demo, but um, just to kind of speed it up. But generally, this is the thought process that I'm kind of going through. So now I'm looking through, trying to see if there's any other references that I might be interested in. 
So I'm scrolling through. I don't find anything. This, these are uh, the open flags here are referenced. Like if you were to go on the internet and say, hey, what are the, what are the arguments to the open API? Oh my gosh, I think every time I step on that. I'm back? Okay. Um, I gotta find where I was on the. Whatever, we'll just start playing from there. I think that's. Okay, I'll just play it like this. Um, so, yeah, so these open flags are uh, flags that are specifically for the open API. We were able to find that through Googling, right? And so we know that we're kind of going in the right direction. Then we scroll up to the very first constructor. And we see that there's a uh, safe file handle open, um, Unix file stream constructor, and then we see an open method uh, being called. And if, if you were to look at on Google, those, uh, the open method or open API has three arguments that it needs. And so now we're inside of uh, the safe file handle class. And so we see this open method, and then we see interop.sys.open, which is likely sounds like it's getting lower kind of into the stack. And so when we open that up and check that out, now we found our pinvoke definition, right? And so we now know that the open, uh, open function is implemented by, by system.native, and then uh, its true name is called system.native underscore open, and then we re they're renaming it as open so that you can reference it that way. And so now we have that uh, definition for pinvoke, and so we can actually implement it or like literally just steal it from Microsoft. All right, I'm just gonna try that. Are we good over there? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what I ended up literally just cutting and pasting and saying, okay, now I have a reference to how to call p invoke or open from p invoke. And so this is kind of the, the solution to what we're going for on being able to define that p invoke definition for the open API. And so at the end of the day, now we have the p invoke definition for create file, which is the Windows API that we need to use. And we have the p invoke definition for open, which is the Unix API that we need to use. All right, so now we have another problem. Um, we have two, two different API calls, but I don't, my users don't wanna know, oh, well, if I'm doing this on Unix, I need to call open, and if I'm doing this on Windows, I need to call create file. Yes? I don't even know what iLibs are, to be honest. Oh, sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know that to be honest. Oh, well, yes. You said yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so I don't know the answer to that question. Yep, I've never tried it. All right. So, um, so again, users don't want to have to know the difference between create file and open. So I need to abstract that for them somehow, right? And so that uh, when when they're calling Power Forensics is Power Forensics API. Uh, they can just call the API without reg any regard for what operating system they're on, what version of PowerShell they're using, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. So this is where, again, I stole some stuff from source code from Microsoft. And so uh, the way that they kind of do it is they use uh, what's called a pre-processing directive. And so what this is is you're telling the compiler how to process code before it actually compiles it. And so there's... Uh, there's way more pre-processing directives than what I'm showing here, but the ones that I'm using are if, else, and end if, right? So I'm sure we all pretty much know what that means. Um, basically, if allows you to look for the presence of a symbol, which can be defined in code or in the overarching project. Um, else does what hap or is what happens when that symbol is not defined, and then end if just ends your statement. And so here, the project.json file, um, we define a core CLR symbol, which I guess I should point here which is this, right? So now when the uh, PowerShell core project is compiled, it's going to run the portion that's looking for the core CLR symbol. And then uh, when the other, port, the PowerShell version two, or Power Forensics version two project is compiled, it's going to compile a second part. So let's see kind of what that looks like. You could. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll show how that, so there's kind of a small nuance, but I'll, 
show why that's the case. So this is where I define those. Uh, yeah, that is a very good question. Okay, so ultimately we have this function called get file stream, right? And so this is doing the same, it's basically doing the same thing that they were doing in, in the assembly, right? And so ultimately what we want is a, a file stream, which is what open and create file return, or they give you a handle, which you can then create a file stream from. Um, but the cool thing about PowerShell core is, or the core CLR, is it has the ability to check what platform it's running on, right? .NET 3.5 didn't know that it was going to be running on multiple platforms, and so it doesn't have that variable. And so that's really what we're testing to check for, right? And so uh, if, if core CLR is defined, then we're checking to see if it's on Windows. If it is on Windows, we run create file. If it's not on Windows, we run open. Um, in the case where core CLR is not defined, then we just are going to do, oh, there it is, okay. We're just gonna do create file, right? And so that's, that's all we're doing is just, uh, or .NET Core gives us the ability to check the platform, right? And so it kind of gives us a little bit more logic there. Does that answer the question, I think? Yep, cool, yeah. All right, so uh, I think we've solved that now. So now users don't have to worry. So when I say users in this tense, I'm kind of, or in this case, I'm talking about somebody that's contributing to Power Forensics, the library, right? Um, and so they don't have to know, they're, they're going to be operating above the file stream level, and so they don't have to know, do I need to use open, create file, am I on Unix, am I on Windows, whatever. It's just gonna work for them, hopefully. Um, and so problem number four is correcting this, the right assembly, right? So now we have, kind of three, and I haven't introduced one of them, but kind of three different versions of Power Forensics. One is uh, Power Forensics, which runs on, on uh, well, it's compiled for .NET 3.5, and then we have Power Forensics Core, which is compiled with .NET Standard 1.6, or uh, the Core CLR. Um, and then we also have Power Forensics Portable, but at the end of the day, you as the user don't want to, like, you, most people are not going to care about the project enough. They're gonna download what they, perceived to be power forensics, and if it doesn't run, they're gonna be like, this is shit, I don't wanna do this anymore, I'm gonna go back to Ubuntu with Python stuff that doesn't work well together. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's true. All right, so, uh, so as the developer, I need to be able to provide them with kind of a seamless experience, I suppose. All right, so the thing that we're going to talk about, and I already showed this uh, a little bit, is this, uh, the CS project, and so, let's see, where is it? All right, so here what I'm doing is I'm like assemb uh, defining the assembly name, and so both projects are going to pr produce the same assembly name, um, the same root namespace, so uh, regardless of whether you're using Power Forensics Core or Power Forensics, everything's going to be in the Power Forensics namespace. Um, and then in this case, I'm, I'm compiling uh, and outputting my library to lib psv2 and then in the in the other case it's going to be like lib CL, core clr and that way I'm, i have some logic to be able to choose which assembly to load up when i load my module so here's what the ultimate solution looks like i'm just going to leave it kind of minimized if anybody can't see let me know um, the solution is to load the correct assembly is very similar to what we did uh, with the pre-processing directives, but it's inside the module itself. And so here what we're doing is we're uh, basically saying, hey, if a PS version table contains PS addition and the addition is not desktop, then load the core CLR version. Um, otherwise, go ahead and just lo load the PowerShell version two. So if it's just Windows PowerShell, let's just load the PowerShell version two, which is compatible with every version of Windows that I've tried. Um, there may be a case where it's not. Um, Otherwise, if it's core CLR, we could load the core CLR version. All right, so this kind of brings me to the point to where um, what I think some people, some people have had a hard time grasping is that assemblies end up being libraries which expose functions and methods that you can then call, right? And so um, originally when I was doing Power Forensics, I would implement uh, the commandlets in C Sharp and then like when you load the, load the assembly, it just loads up those commandlets for you. Um, there's another kind of, the other way would be to just allow the library to be a library which exposes those methods um, and then create advanced functions in PowerShell to be able to wrap those, right? And so you like, 
Uh, at the end of the day, you would have like power forensics dot boot sector dot master boot record, and then you would have a git method to be able to do that. And so um, the, the biggest reason why I think that this is useful from my perspective is that casual contributors aren't going to want to write C sharp code and have to compile and worry about having the right uh, Visual Studio, you know, everything. And so they're going to want to write a PS1 file, right? And so uh, they don't want to deal with uh, C sharp. And so I found that after I started making my commandlets or functions in, in PowerShell, people were much more likely to kind of help me out. All right, so uh, the problem is, is if you have to worry about what's exposed by this library, right? You have to know what what APIs you can you can play with, right? And so um, I have a website, powerforensics.readthedocs.io, which uh, is at current state, I must admit, is about as well documented as some of the stuff that I'm complaining about in this in this presentation. <laughs> um, but it, it generally has all the different commandlets that are available to you, and it has all at least the names of the classes and methods and properties that you're going to be dealing with when you're kind of trying to implement something. So I'm going back through, but after you have like 300,000 lines of code, it's really hard to write in all the comments and all that stuff to, yeah. I want to have a life, I guess, I try. All right, so now we have a demo of Power Forensics running on all kinds of different platforms. So this was the thing that we were going for. So this is PowerShell 5.1 on Windows 10. Hopefully it's running. There we go. All right, just do a PS version table, show 5.1 dot yada, yada, yada. And then we're going to import Power Forensics. And then calling git forensic master boot record, reason being is that that is compatible with everything. So you can't, you can't query like NTFS stuff on Linux because Linux isn't NTFS formatted. And here we see we have, you know, three or so NTFS partitions that came back. So here's PowerShell 2 on Windows 7. All right, so there's PowerShell 2. Importing the module. This kept going off the screen, so just use format table. And here we have, you know, two NTFS partitions. So kind of going through everything. Uh, disk, each each hard drive is going to have a signature, so we're parsing that out. And then we have PowerShell six on Windows ten, which is uh, open source PowerShell. Um, and here we see it's kind of out of order, but we see six dot o dot o dot dash alpha. And then for is Windows, we see that it is on Windows. And now, um, this is my development machine, so I have like 10 versions of Power Forensics, so I just wanted to make sure that I was loading the, the correct one up. And then running Git Forensic Master Boot Record again. All right, and so three NTFS partitions. So that's now proven that the core version of Power Forensics is working, but here's kind of like the, the exciting part, I think, is running on OS X. All right, so we see 6.0.0.alpha, or dash alpha, is OS X. Just so you believe I didn't just turn around the slashes or something like that. I know, yeah, I suck at that, yeah. I didn't say that I use OS X for PowerShell right now, I just, yeah. All right, so in R disk zero is the like the reference to the the raw disk, and so um, yeah, on OS X it's going to be uh, GPT formatted, so it's kind of crappy to show, but uh, that's just proving that we can indeed read from the hard drive and then parse the bytes that we get returned to us. Yeah. All right, so so we've talked about trying to you know organize our project, have uh, an assembly that runs both on everything from PowerShell version 2 and up and on OS X and Linux. Um, but what about trying to run this stuff remotely, right? So I want to be able to run 
Power Forensics on a remote system that doesn't necessarily have Power Forensics installed. And so um, we kind of took a note out of the bad guys, so these two's uh, pocket or, or notebook or whatever. Um, yeah, these two are the bad guys. Um, and so the idea here is that you can take the assembly and uh, load it in memory, right? And so uh, the system.reflection.assembly class has a load method which takes a byte array. That byte array is going to be interpreted as a C-sharp assembly. Um, and then it's going to be loaded up and, uh, and expose the public functions and methods and all that kind of stuff uh, from that assembly. And so then we, uh, I kind of wrapped it up in this function called add power forensics type, which is going to do the same thing uh, that we do when we load the module normally. So it's going to check, hey, is this, you know, does this need the core version or does this need the, like, the full CLR version? Um, and then it's going to expose that to us. And then you can pass those functions to, uh, through invoke command uh, to call them, right? And so this is what that looks like. So here we have, let me, I'm going to show it in the source code because it's a little bit more interesting. Modules, power forensics. No, I don't mean. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show that here in a second. It, yeah, because otherwise it would be, yes. Yeah, so these numbers here tell you how many, basically how many bytes that assembly is, right? So 173,000. And so like, I mean, we could just do this literally all day and keep scrolling and keep scrolling over and over. I mean, you see how small this guy is over here? It's just gonna keep going. So that, and apparently, I think I talked to you about this, but like, it's so long that it, yeah, can you fix that in Visual Studio Code? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Well, if we turn on word wrapping, it's gonna be gig ginormous. Oh, okay. I just want you to fix everything that I have a problem with. Um, and so then it, then it loads it up. So one of the cool, uh, Matt asked the question, uh, is it this? I don't know. I tried to set up all this like nice cool stuff, but it's not super good yet. Uh, I don't know, there's like a batch build script somewhere in here that I don't know what I did with it. Yeah, uh, so this batch script will basically uh, like do all the management of uh, putting the, the file, like the assemblies in the right spot, um, but then it will also call a PowerShell function, which, um, or a PowerShell, I don't know if this calls it. There is a power, yeah, this build.ps1 is going to basically do all the encoding and replace that every time we build the assembly. Um, that base 64 string gets replaced. Otherwise, you would want to be, you'd probably want to kill yourself. All right, let's see. Yep, all right, so uh, I didn't think I would have enough time uh, to do the demo, but apparently I might have. Um, oh, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> yeah, this computer doesn't, my cough out is that this computer does not have a, v a remote VM to run on. Um, yeah, so, uh, so basically the idea would be to create a new PowerShell or uh, a P new PS session on a remote system, and then you can use this kind of uh, function, this notation to call a local function and pass that to a remote system. And so the first one is going to load add power forensics type into your remote session, and the second one is going to call the get forensic USN journal function and return the output to your variable there. And so uh, now we're able to run this kind of stuff remotely, unfortunately. I don't have a video of that. All right, so I guess I'm wrapping up early, but uh, in summary, I talked about integrating .NET Core. Um, and so the idea that if you're only focused on uh, dealing with .NET Core, the latest and greatest, or you completely control the environment that your, your project is going to be run in, uh, you could literally just go open up Visual Studio 2017, create a new app, transfer all your source code over, and you're good to go. Um, if not, then you kind of have to have a multiple project kind of outlook. Um, and so for me, I need .NET 3.5 and then I need uh, whatever the latest version of Core CLR is. And so uh, you want all your source code in one place, everything referencing it, and then it all just kind of works magically. Uh, Cross-platform APIs, so we had, for instance, uh, we had create file, we wanted to know how to use open, and so we're able to, with you know, the greatness that Microsoft is, they open source everything, we could literally just go in and uh, look in GitHub to figure out what their implementation is. Um, and so like, if you go and look in you know, that system underscore native uh, DLL or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, um, 
you can see like every implementation of every uh, p invoke that they're that they're referencing. All right. Um, then we're talking about abstracting APIs and making sure that the uh, the bad or the users, the bad guys, the people that are going to be developing on your project, um, don't have to worry about the nuance between different operating system versions, right? Because they don't want to worry about that. They're already writing a parser for the the Windows registry, right? So if they have to worry about, oh, am I on, you know, do I have to check if I'm on Windows or Linux? Uh, that's that's going to just make it not fun. Uh, then we talk about the multiple assemblies uh, issue and making sure that we're loading the right one and then possibly being able to run those assemblies remotely um, through through invoke command or over WS name. Uh, sure, yeah, so um, in in forensics you, uh, so the problem is is that we're looking at the hard drive, right? And so ultimately, I don't want to be stomping over all the hard drive artifacts. So this is kind of maybe a unique case, but it might be something that you're concerned with as well. Um, you don't want to st over, like stomp over all the like files on the on the hard drive because, for instance, if I want to recover a deleted file, the way that that works is you have the master file table, right? Every time you create a file, an entry goes into the master file table for that file, and then it tells you, hey, if you want to find the data for this file, that's over there. Just go go grab it, right? Well. When I delete the file, the way NTFS works is uh, it doesn't delete the master file table entry. It just goes in and flips a bit and says, you know, hey, this is now deleted, um, and don't worry about it. Um, but it also lets, lets the, uh, the NTFS driver know that if it needs to create a new file, that uh, MFT record is now available to overwrite, right? So um, presuming you delete a file and no new file is ever created, which you know, on like solid state drives, this might be relatively hard, or on your dev dev system, that might be hard. Um, but presuming a new file is never created, even though you've deleted the file, you can still go back and get that information, right? Um, and so, us dropping in the case of like an incident response, dropping a bunch of files on the system is going to, you know, reduce the chance that we're able to recover important artifacts. Um, the other thing that we do when we're investigating is we we create kind of a temporal timeline, so time-based timeline, and we're able to say uh, what what happened on this system between time X and time Y, right? And that kind of allows us to build context around uh, what we're looking at. So like we see uh, process X was running and, you know, is, you know, win update.exe or something like that. And so uh, I don't know what win, up, win update.exe is, but I could figure out when win update.exe was created on the file system, right? And so then I could also say, let me see what happened around the time that that was created. Um, and so there may be deleted files that, or files that have since been deleted that were created around that time. But if I'm trampling all over the hard drive, now I no longer have that information to kind of review. And so uh, that's kind of the idea behind trying to stay in memory as much as possible. I feel like there should be a picture for that from trying to help describe it. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, so if anybody's like a hardcore developer um, trying to help me write some of the parsers that, that I have to write, so like uh, one of the kind of core fundamentals of Power Forensics is that I want to use the, the OS as little as possible, so I don't want to call APIs, so like the US in journal, there's APIs to be able, like you could use, I um, can't even think of what it is, device IO control to like call ioctals and then read uh, or like interpret the uh, US in journal. Um, but Obviously, that can be hooked, and then now you're getting false information or you're getting lied to. And so, like for instance, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, there's a database, like a SQLite database or an ESC database, and now I'm going to use the Windows function to parse that out. It's like, hey, I have these bytes, right, hundreds of thousands of bytes, and I need to be able to parse that to determine what's happening, right? So if you're, if you're a big developer and you like reverse engineering kind of data structures and that kind of thing, that could be one place you could help. Um, another one might even be as simple as, Here's something I was trying to do, you know, in a security context or like figure out what happened on this system. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily have the skills to implement that, but like give me some ideas. Um, or uh, if you're interested in just kind of the API that Power Forensics kind of gives out or exposes allows you to do a lot of things that I just haven't thought to do. And so like, for instance, let's say you want to detect uh, time stomping, right? So an attacker may drop a bad file and then change the timestamp to try to make it go back in time so it blends in, right? Um, there, 
there is a way to try to detect that with power forensics. Um, I just haven't written a function that does that automatically, right? And so uh, maybe that's something you want to kind of contribute. Yep. Yep. So uh, with the new .NET SDK 1.0, can you really simplify your project structure to have the blocks be applied to a whole bunch of Oh, well, that's yeah. awesome. That's kind of what I was hoping for out of this, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And it just it spits out just like you're doing two time local binaries and then I use similar thing to get one to load the other one. Oh cool. Yeah, so it's way easier now and the ability to get code automatically copied is really cool. So oh, okay. Get rid of this well, studio and I will be talking to you. I might even just like come over to your house and uh, with some beers or something. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anybody else have any questions? Cool. Well thank you for your time. I appreciate it.